This is going to be a video response to some of Joe Smith's points, which are made in his paper Existential Inertia and the Aristotelian Proof. He first characterizes existential inertia in the following way. Existential inertia thesis. Necessary concrete objects persist in existence once in existence without requiring a continuously concurrent sustaining cause of their existence and to cease to exist only if caused to do so. Immediately after this, Joe presents a counterexample, or a few counterexamples actually, to ex existential inertia. But I think there are some obvious counterexamples he missed in this first section, which are better. First, participation relations. Consider, for example, when a towel is wet because it is soaked in water. In this case, the towel is not wet in itself, but is wet precisely by participation in the wetness of the water, which is soaking the towel. As soon as the water is removed from the towel, the towel will no longer be wet. And this happens immediately, because it was only wet by participation in the towel's wetness. So it seems clear that this is an example of a persistence by a present sustaining cause. Secondly, we can consider distinguishing features. A man is made different from other animals, for example, by his rationality. If a man did not have rationality, then he would not be a man. Hence, a man is dependent uh, for his existence, at least as a man, um, on his rationality here and now in a sustaining relationship. Clearly then, uh, differentiating features are sustaining causes of the differences between things at the present ta time that things are different. Thirdly, parts and whole relationships. Again, I think we would all agree that a man would not exist if none of his parts existed. If, for example, removed we were to remove all of a man's cells from his body, then the man would no longer exist at that very moment. Hence, it follows that the whole depends on its parts for its existence and a sustaining relationship here and now. Now, you might object that while these sorts of relationships are sustaining causes, there are also cases where there there is an existential inertia. But that doesn't seem possible, say perhaps one case. Specifically, anything that is in a participation relationship is distinguished from others by additional features or which has parts uh, would have to have these uh, per se sustaining relationships for their existence. Everything that exists except God would fit in that category. Everything other than God would depend on something in a per se sustaining causal relationship. Now, Joe does respond to the parts and whole dependency later in his article, so let's take a look at his response. He offers two responses. Here is the first. First, it is plausible that parts of substances are only intelligible with reference to the substance they compose. Thus, the identities of the parts are determinate and intelligible only in light of the identity of the whole substance. Their existence, qua the things they are then, presuppose the ontologically prior existence of the substance and hence cannot causally explain its existence. Indeed, arguably a part of, this, of a substance efficiently causing the existence of the substance amounts to self-causation, since if X causes Y to exist, Y causes the parts of Y to exist, qua parts of Y. Hence, if a part causes its substance to exist, it causes itself to exist qua parts of the substance, which is absurd. The sense in which the parts are causes of the whole 
is the sense in which they are unified in the whole. If they were not unified in a whole, then they would not be parts of a whole. So there's a dependency there. Now, what makes it the case that the parts are unified as a whole? In a Thomistic view, the cause of that here and now is the form, which is what limits the activity to be towards a specific end. Consider the difference between, for example, the parts of an eye separated and the parts of an eye as parts of a whole. What makes them a unity is their common purpose. They're working together for the end of seeing. After being separated, the parts of an eye no longer have that common end of seeing, and so they are no longer a part of a whole, which we call an eye. But why do all of the parts tend towards that common end? On a Thomistic view, it is because they all participate in the common form of an eye. The parts, as unified, causes the existence of the whole, and the form causes the unity of the parts. For Thomas, the unity of the parts in the participation relationship with the form is a type of unity. And the actual fact of the parts acting for a common end is another type of unity. So we can talk about the wholeness of an eye in the sense of particip its participation in the form of the eyeness, and its wholeness in the sense of its production of a common property which flows from the matter and form composite. The common property, for example, being sight. The unity or wholeness of the formal sense is not in fact caused by the parts considered as parts since in themselves they do not have the wholeness they don't have what it is to be an eye in themselves. The wholeness, or what it is to be an eye in itself, of the property of seeing, however, in the Thomistic sense, is caused by the parts as a unity of the whole. And whether the wholeness with respect to the properties exists has no bearing on whether the wholeness of the parts exists. So there is no circularity there because the parts are united by the form and not vice versa, and the properties are united by the parts and not vice versa. There is also a sense in which the form depends on the parts for its existence. While the form contributes the unity uh, to the parts, the parts are merely potential with respect to the unity. While the form contributes the unity to the parts, and the parts are merely potential with respect to the unity, the parts do not contribute nothing to the whole. In itself, the form is merely a limiter. It limits act to be of a specific kind. In our example, the form limits the actions of the parts to be of an eye kind. Although the parts of an eye are only potentially united in themselves, they still have the raw activity that can be directed to the end of seeing and by the unifying form. Without that activity, without that internal tendency, the form could not unite anything. It is not circular because the form and the parts are not providing the same sort of causal force. The form doesn't get its power to limit the activity of the parts from the parts, and the parts do not get their activity from the form. And yet, they depend on each other. The parts depend on the whole for its unity, for its definition, and, and its, its limitation and the form depends on the parts for its activity or actuality. Now, let's move on to Joe's second objection. Second, Phaser actually agrees that parts of the substances do not exist actually, and hence only exist potentially. The hydrogen and oxygen are in the water only virtually rather than actually. This is evident from the way 
water behaves. Something similar can be said of the other chemical elements and of quarks and other particles present in, the or, in organic and organic substances. Indeed, Baser reasons such parts cannot be present in actually since their essential properties are not present when they are part of the substance. But since, per one of Phaser's premises, only actual th things can actualize something potential for existence, it follows that the parts Phaser reduces cannot actually actualize the existence of the substance they compose. I think probably a better way of thinking of hydrogen oxygen not actually existing in water is to say instead that hydrogen oxygen exists as united in the whole of water rather than as divided parts. It isn't as if oxygen and hydrogen completely disappear when water is formed, but rather they're united by a common end. And since Thomas define things by their ends, we say water and hydrogen don't exist actually in that sense. But they still exist in some sense, that is, they exist as a unified whole we call water. So they are actual in a sense. They just are not actual as hydrogen and as oxygen. What this implies is merely that they cannot provide any actuality specific to hydrogen and oxygen. So they cannot burn, for example, which isn't controversial. But since they do exist in a sense, they are actual in a sense. They can actualize things in a sense. And one sense is specifically in the sense that parts cause the existence of wholes. That is, as providing the activity which is shaped towards the common end that water has by the form of water. Next, Joe presents two accounts of existential inertia. Here's the first account. For concrete object O at times T minus one and T, where T minus one is immediately temporarily prior to T, the existence of O at T is explained by the conjunction of the state and existence of O at T minus one, and the absence of any sufficiently causal destructive factors acting on O at T minus one and through T. Joe first examines the possibility of this account being viciously circular. I, I'm not really that impressed by that objection so I will not respond to, the, to his objection to that claim. Uh, I also don't have any objections to the idea that things have the ability to persist in existence. Maybe something could be argued on the point that God provides the ability for things to persist, but it depends on how you define these terms and it's just not worthwhile. My concern is more with the idea that things which existed in the past can be the complete explanation of the existence of things here and now. Joe lays out an, ex an objection to that view that I have sympathy with as follows. If presentism is true, only present things exist, and surely only things that exist can have explanatory efficiency. Hence. O's existence at T cannot be explained by past states and existence of O, since such state simply doesn't exist. Now, Joe claims that this objection depends on presentism, and technically it does because of the way it's formalized, but one can object to the idea of past events being the sole cause of future events existing without presupposing presentism. All we have to do is argue that past things do not immediately act on present things. I think it could be argued that what we mean by A existing in the present is that A has the capacity to immediately act on things in the present, given no physical restraint. Think about it. 
If Abraham Lincoln were immediately present to us, talking to us, shaking hands with us, would we not consider this proof that Abraham Lincoln exists here and now? Abraham Lincoln immediately acting on us seems to be a valid way of interpreting what being present right now means. And so even if you held that the past still exists in some sense, on one interpretation of what being present means, you could hold that the difference between past things and present things is that past things do not and cannot immediately act on things present to us, even without physical restraints. Under this interpretation of presence, if a past thing immediately acted on something currently existing, then it would actually, by this definition, be a current thing, since having a sort of capacity to act immediately on a thing is just what we mean by it, a thing being present to it. I think this view of presence has a historical backing as well in St. Thomas Aquinas' works. When St. Thomas Aquinas describes God's presence to creatures, for example, he describes it in the following way. He is in all things, giving the being power and operation, so he is in every place as giving it existence and lo locative power. St. Thomas Aquinas doesn't want to say that God is present in the sense of that he is limited to a particular time, location, or has the property of time, t time one or location one. Having these things would make God composite and limited. Instead, St. Thomas Aquinas defines presence as, in terms of God's active power being immediately present to creatures in a sense. It seems to me that if one were to object to the Thomistic account that things are sustained in existence by something present at the same time, by saying that something in the past could immediately affect things currently existing, this is based on an underlying misunderstanding of the Thomistic concept of presence. For a past event to affect something currently existing immediately is, by the Thomistic definition of presence, simply for it to exist now. Now, maybe it doesn't exist in the sense of having the property of T1, if there is such a thing, but the Thomist never claimed that a per se cause must exist at the same time in that sense, since that would rule out God as a per se cause. So, to summarize, the past things cannot immediately cause current things to, to exist because, by the definition of presence presented by Thomism, things would, which act immediately, that is, not through a medium, are present. They exist now. This is true re regardless of whether you think presentism is false or whether you think there is something like a property of time one or whatever. Now, this leaves open the possibility of past things acting immediately, i.e. through a medium, on current things, and that is where we will get to next. So Joe also says the following. Second, Presentists are, in general, content with past states explaining present states. After all, it is quite difficult to reconcile our ordinary common sense ex explanatory practices as well as our standard scientific practices with a view according to which past states have no explanatory force whatsoever. End quote. This is true, but not immediately. Think about how we can see stars, for example, that no longer exist. This is because the stars act on us through a medium, through the mediation of light, which take many years to travel. It would be a lot harder to think of this as a common sense view when we, we are talking about immediate action. Now, if all that Joe is going to claim is that past events can explain future events through the mediation of some medium like light, then we are not going to disagree at all. But then the medium would ultimately have to be an immediate causal relation 
But basically, it seems once you understand the, this concept of presence, it follows inescapably that there must be a cause that acts in the present. We could make a syllogism something like this. One, a cause is either immediate or immediate. Two, if a cause is mediated, then that medium is either present to the effect in a mediated or immediate way. Three, but the series of mediums cannot be infinite. Therefore, there must be an immediate cause. And because we're defining being present as an activity which is immediate to the effect, it follows inescapably that the cause must be present to the effect at the present time. Now, one thing we could note is that not all causes have to act immediately on another for it to be present at the same time necessarily. It also seems like there could be a sense in which uh, cause is present at the same time but not acting through a medium. We just have to say that the reason we call these things present at the same time is because it is immediately present to a medium that is immediately present to the effect. Or at least it could be given the lack of spatial or physical constraints. Things which are actually separated by time seem to be incapable of acting on things here and now immediately regardless of spatial and physical constraints. Anyway, I, I agree with Joe that things in the past can act on things in a mediated manner, but they could not do so in an immediate manner because then they would be present to the effect. They also cannot act on a medium that is immediately present to the effect. Uh, let me explain. If a star were immediately acting on light, for example, when the light is acting on our eyes, there would be a sense in which the star still exists because it is immediately present to the light, which is immediately present to your eyes by active power. And if the star were not immediately acting on the light, then the light would have to have all of the active power to make us see the star in itself without the action of the star, which would make it the total source of that causal power in a per se causal way. Put it another way, if the light did not have the active power here and now in itself, then it would have to have here and now in the star that active power, which is indistinguishable from the star immediately acting on the light and therefore being present here and now to the light. And uh, that would be an issue because then you would have the star being present at the same time as the light. And this is intuitively obvious in another way. Even if the star did not actually exist in the past or at any time at all, say the light just popped into existence five seconds ago rather than originating from a star, the light would still appear the same. It would look like a star when we looked at the light. But if the causal power of the light hitting our eyes were not entirely in the light, if it were derived from the star, we would have to hold that without the star actually having existed, there would be no effect. But that doesn't seem to be the case. It seems that past effects are only accidentally related to the current causes. That is, current causes have all the power they have, regardless of whether they popped into existence five seconds ago or were caused by a distant star. If we accept the presentist account of time, and Phaser does, it seems like existential inertia is a pretty easy position to respond to. First, we just follow the arguments from Scott Sullivan's book, St. Thomas Aquinas and the Principle of Sufficient Reason, that whatever exists must have that by which it is distinguished from nothing, in itself or in another. Now, if things in the past no longer exist, then they cannot distinguish something from nothing, since they are nothing. Just as a red ball cannot be distinguished from a blue ball by red paint that used to exist, 
but doesn't exist now. Something which no longer exists cannot distinguish something from nothing. There may be a sense in which past things can cause effects, but not in this sense. So to summarize, I think Cho's account of existential inertia fails because it fails to take into account a Thomistic concept of presence and the principle of sufficient reason. Here is Joe's second view of existential inertia. Quote, existential inertia is a basic, primitive, foundational feature of reality. My response is simply that existential inertia is not a basic, primitive, foundational feature of reality. I already explained why to a degree above, but we should also note that we know that they, there is a difference between existing and non-existing things, and that things which are identical in every way are not different. It follows that there must be something by which existing things are distinguished from non-existing things. This distinguishing feature must exist because something which doesn't exist cannot distinguish existing things from non-existing things. It must be immediately present to either the medium it is acting through or to the effect because otherwise they would not exist. The only way the medium could exist without immediately driving that distinguishing power here and now from another is if it had the power of distinguishing itself from non-existence here and now. But then you have to deal with the various arguments against mediums having that sort of power of distinguishing itself from nothing in itself. For example, the argument for motion, the argument from composition, etc. These arguments ultimately argue that, that creatures do not have their power to exist in themselves because they change or because they're composites. You could even say that by nature mediating powers do not have the power to exist in themselves since they by definition receive the powers from the in initial cause. I could go into more details about this but this is basically St. Thomas Aquinas' entire end of these arguments in the first place. Creatures do not have existence in themselves, so they ultimately must have their existence in something which has existence in itself. Simply asserting that existential inertia is metaphysically necessary does nothing to address any of the Thomistic positions, but merely ignores it. Existential inertia isn't really a response to the proofs for God's existence, but a misunderstanding of them. Basically, I think a large part of the reason Joe thinks existential inertia is possible is because he isn't aware of the Thomistic principle sufficient reason. Check out this dialogue between a theist and atheist Joe presents in this paper, for example. Quote, Smith, why does God persist in existence? Jones, because God is purely actual. Smith, but what feature of reality makes it to, to be the case that God is purely actual? What explains that? Jones, it is metaphysically necessary that this is the case. Smith, but why is it metaphysically necessary? Jones, well, it just is. It is true that we cannot ultimately provide more fundamental principles which make it the case that the first principle is true, but that doesn't mean we just assert that something is metaphysically necessary. We believe the first principle is metaphysically necessary because we immediately grasp its truth from experience. The first principle is simply knowledge of existence, although in a very basic way, knowledge that leads to the conclusions such as being is not non-being. That then is the basis for the conclusion that God necessarily exists since his essence is existence and other such conclusions. I would argue that by contrast existential inertia is just an arbitrary assertion. There's no reason to believe that existential inertia 
would be metaphysically necessary, not even based purely on experience rather than by arguments. And that seems to be the main points of Job's paper that I want to respond to anyway. The basic point, I think, is that once we understand the Thomistic view of parts and wholes, presence and the PSR, the idea of existential inertia simply falls completely apart. We must have something immediately acting here and now on things which exist to distinguish them from nothing, otherwise they would be nothing, which is absurd. I think that's the main takeaway. Thanks for watching.